All right. The title of my sermon this morning comes from Ecclesiastes 3 3. Ecclesiastes 3 3 says, A time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up. And what we're preaching about is a time to kill and the, the biblical use of force, being able to, to, to use force against people and when it's appropriate, when it's not appropriate, things like that. And we started off here, of course, in Numbers chapter 35, which outlines. You know, murder and how to handle murderers and, and what constitutes murder and things like that. Now, before we even get started, because this is, um, this is a subject that needs to be, it's, it's a weighty matter. It's something that needs to be taken very importantly. It's not just rhetoric. This isn't something just to get fired up about, you know, because I'm going to be talking about guns and all, you know, all kinds of different things. And it's easy to just kind of get carried away and especially in this murderous and adulterous generation to, that, that glorifies and glamorizes violence and murder to kind of get swept up into that type of mindset. And we're not doing that at all because, see, God puts a high value on life, a very, very high value on our life. And it's not something to be taken lightly. So even when we're reading these books, you, know, you might want to sound real hard and just, oh, man, yeah, we got to put him to death. Yeah, you know, we should put people to death that are murderers and, and follow the, the laws that God has outlined. But it's not something ever that's just taken lightly. It is a weighty matter. There's, um, the Bible is in Genesis 9, 6. You know, this is right after the flood. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. Why? For in the image of God made he man. God made man in his own image. And he's saying, this is, this is, man is special. Man is not a beast of the field. Man is not, you know, a, a dog or a, a cow or cattle, you know, things that you could use to eat or, you know, any other part of his creation. Man is special. Man was created in God's own image. Amen. So when a man is killed, when, when someone sheds man's blood, God says the only recompense for that is that, well, you know what? Then by man, their blood needs to be shed. That's the only way you could, you could balance out that type of a heinous act of someone actually killing or murdering someone else is by taking the life of that person because he values man so much. This was such a big deal. You know, even though we know, and we're going to go over some of the justifications for taking another person's life. I mean, obviously, even in, the, in Genesis 9, when someone commits murder, the per someone has to then take their life, right? So someone is going to have to actually perform the action of doing that killing, doing that, you know, removal of that person's life. That has to be justified. Otherwise, God wouldn't say, well, this has to be done, right? So the person doing it isn't going to be guilty of shedding blood or guilty of murder, because they're executing judgment. That is a justified use of force. That is a justified taking of someone else's life. Obviously, I mean, it, you'd have to be, you know, you have to not have a brain to understand the concept, right? I mean, it's literally, it's, it's, it's so simple to understand. And God is very careful in, in his word to outline what murder really is. When he says, you know, People like to say, you turn to Exodus 20 and say, oh, it says thou shalt not kill, right? It's one of the Ten Commandments. Well, then how could, you know, why is he telling people to go against his commandment, thou shalt not kill? Because kill in that context is talking about murder. It's not just talking about taking someone else's life. I mean, that, that's obvious. And, and, and all throughout, you look at like, all the other supporting scriptures, and that's why we started with Numbers 35, because it goes into great detail about what he's talking about of, okay, in this situation, this is murder. In this situation, it's not murder, right? And, and what the appropriate punishments are for both. But to, to, to demonstrate what, you know, one last time on the importance and the value that God puts on human life, even though there are times where it is justified to take someone else's life, and the Bible, you know, even in war, it's justified. It can be justified, right? I mean, obviously, we're not talking about the gross war crimes of people just, just raping and, you know, like, like doing horrible things, you know, off in war. But, but in general, when you're fighting a war, 
especially a defensive war. Someone comes in and attacks your land and you're defending yourself and fighting. That is not murder when you're, when you're killing the enemy coming in and attacking you. That's justified. And um, David was an example of that. David, remember, David wanted to build the temple to God. He did many great things for God. Now, he definitely had his sin. He had a grievous sin with his with committing adultery and, and the murder of uh, Uriah the Hittite. But the Bible says in, in 1 Chronicles 22 that the reason why God would not allow him to build the temple, it wasn't even because of his sin against Uriah and committing adultery, which you could have looked at that and been like, that's enough anyways. But that's not what the Bible says is the reason. I'll read for you from 1 Chronicles 22, verse 7. The Bible says, And David said to Solomon, My son, as for me, it was in my mind to build a house under the name of the Lord my God. But the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Thou hast shed blood abundantly, and hast made great wars. Thou shalt not build a house unto my name, because thou hast shed much blood upon the earth in my sight. It's because he ended up killing a lot of people. He's saying, look, you, you know, You've served me, David. God loved David. He made David great promises, right? He blessed David. But he says, when it comes to building my temple, your hands are too, you've shed too much blood. Even if, his, even if those wars are considered justified in God's eyes, which they were. I mean, God, he, was, he kept going to God. God, should I fight against these people? God, what should I do here? And God was giving him victory after victory. But still, he said, you know what? You've shed a lot of blood. So you're not the right person for this job to build my holy temple. Because there's still a value. Even when you're executing a judgment or, or you know, war in warfare, there's still a high value on life. That's good. And, and we can see that that is evident in the Bible. Now, executing judgment, I've already mentioned this, executing judgment of the death penalty is definitely justified killing. It's not murder. And uh, also in, in times of war. Now, we're going to look a little bit more in depth here on Numbers 35 because it introduces the concept of manslaughter. So what they call it a manslayer. Right? I mean, you can see that the words are almost identical. Manslayer, manslaughter. And the, what they did was they appointed certain cities for the, I mean, it, God's design for, for judgment, for, you know, the, the rule of law and everything is, is, is amazing. It's incredible, and, and he's, he's thought of all these different situations, and um, it's so simple overall. It's such a short book to, you know, the books of the law to, to institute and to follow. It's not anything very complicated, but of course, we like, you know, man likes to make things a lot more complicated and, and rule over people more than what God has allowed for, but that's a whole other story. I'm not going to get into that. Let's get into some of these details here in Numbers 35, because not only does it give you explicit information, it's also providing principles. Because at the end of the day, even the, the situations that are brought up in Numbers 35 or elsewhere in the Bible, they don't cover all situations. That's why God instituted judges. People to, he said, here's my law. I've given you this information now, people who love God and love his law and study God's law and are right with, you know, the, the, they're going to judge and determine, okay, in this situation, the, all the principles that we've already learned from God's law, how does this apply now? One of those principles, that's why I started off with the value of life, is an important principle to understand. When it comes to using force and taking somebody else's life, we need to keep that in our mind. That is an important principle. It's not the only principle, but... It's the important principle, one, for taking someone else's life, but also for defending life that God values so highly. Let's look at this verse number 11, number 35, where we, where we had read already this morning. Um, the Bible reads, Then ye shall appoint you cities to be cities of refuge for you, that the slayer may flee thither which killeth any person unawares. And they shall be unto you cities for refuge from the avenger that the manslayer die not until he stand before the congregation in judgment. So when somebody dies, he says, here's these cities that you're going you're gonna to appoint. And the, the, the killer, the slayer is going to go into that city. 
basically away from anybody who might want to avenge the death of their loved one. That's what I was talking about the, the, um, the avenger here. The revenger of blood or the avenger of blood are, are terms that are used in the Bible. So like if someone killed your brother, right? You might want to go out and execute justice upon that person because they killed your brother, right? I mean, it makes sense. You'd be, you're upset. You want, to, you want to deal with it and deal with it right now. But he says, no, no, let him go into one of these cities that's close by. So that way he's not going to be, you know, and also it makes sense. You don't want to be running into a person that just killed your, you know, what, what do you think is going to happen? You know, it's, it's best for that person just to get out of town for, you know, until you can hold a court hearing. Uh, you, could, you could hear the evidence. You could, you could, you could get the witnesses together that's going to say one way or the other and say, yeah, this person, they meant to do it. They're a murderer. You know, they were, they were lying in wait. They tried to kill him. Or it was a total accident, you know. Either way, whether it's an accident or premeditated, the family's going to be upset. Right? They're, you know, they're going to want something done because their, their loved one now is dead. And it's a, it's a serious event. So uh, let's keep reading here. So they, they, God designed it so that there are these cities that the slayer can, can flee to, that they could go off in, they're away from everyone else that's affected by this, and then they could stand before a judge, before the congregation, and, and receive the judgment that is due. And it says, um, verse number 14, you shall give three cities on this side Jordan, three cities shall you give in the land of Canaan, which shall be cities for refuge. These six cities shall be a refuge, both for the children of Israel and for the stranger and for the sojourner among them, that everyone that killeth any person unawares may flee thither. And if he smite him with an instrument of iron so that he die, he is a murderer. The murderer shall surely be put to death. And if he smite him with throwing a stone wherewith he may die and he die, he is a murderer. The murderer shall surely be put to death. Or if he smite him with an hand weapon of wood, wherewith he may die and he die. He is a murderer. The murderer shall surely be put to death. The revenger of blood himself shall slay the murderer. When he meeteth him, he shall slay him. Now, this brings up situations where hey, if you're using an actual instrument, I mean, think, think about this. And this is important to understand because people may get in fights, right? Like fist fights. You may get, you know, people get angry with each other. It turns into a fight. Well, if you get in a fight with somebody, the moment you like pick up a rock and bash somebody's head in, you're a murderer. It doesn't matter if you're in the heat of a moment or whatever, and you're in a fight. Look, when, when you pick up a club or when you do, you know, the Bible's saying you're a murderer. You don't do that. Look, God knows fights are going to happen. He doesn't want people just, you know, even getting into physical fist fights. It's not like, like he wants, you know, us to live. You know, we're supposed to live a peaceful life. But when you go to that next step of, of using an instrument or using something, you know, you're a murderer. And, and, it's, and it's clearly spelled out here in the Bible that that is a situation where you've now made yourself a murderer. Now, I want to point out, but I'm going to get to this in a little bit. I'm going to deal with self-defense a little bit later in the sermon. This is not talking about someone who's defending their own life using an instrument or throw, you know, doing something to protect yourself. This is a situation where there's people gotten some type of altercation, someone died, you know, and, and it was a result of someone using an instrument of iron or throwing a stone or something like that. This is what it's all, and I'll be able to prove that later because just the way it's written, you can say, oh, well, this is every situation, right? If you just went off of this text, you could say, well, if you used... If you use any type of instrument, then you're a murderer. But that's not, that's not, um, we're, we're going we're gonna to get the, to the reason why that's not the case when it comes to you defending your own life, someone coming after you, right? I mean, it's the same thing. You could just use the example of war right off the bat. I mean, if someone's coming after you and you kill them with, an, you know, an instrument of iron like a sword, well, you're not considered a murderer. But uh, anyways, let's, let's keep going here because it, it gets clear when you read the whole passage, what is this talking about? It's defining a murderer versus someone who's just committed manslaughter. Um, 
And also, the, the, I, I like this about God's law, the revenger of blood himself shall slay the murderer. That's part of God. You know, there's a, a, an, an element to justice that the person who has been offended, who's been wronged, actually carries out the judgment. There are a lot of victims today that carry an extra burden with them. One, because the, the aggressor, the person who's committed the crime, the, the heinous crimes, aren't being punished appropriately. And then also because they, you know, like there, there's, there is a healing, believe it or not, that's going to come along with you taking part in, in making sure that, that the wrong gets righted. Appropriately, though. Anyway, we're not talking about vigilantism where you just take the law in your own hand. This is all, this is very clear to say you come before the congregation, you know, there's judges that are going to determine what is right, but then when a person is found guilty of murder, they say, you know what, the revenger of blood is going to slay that person. That's how the, the execution is going to be carried out. There are, there are people today now, of course, especially with other crimes, not necessarily with murder, but I mean murder still, but with other crimes that the Bible carry, says carries a death sentence on, like rape or, you know, God forbid, but like the, the pedophilia and stuff that goes on. And what happens today is that they get slapped, you know, these criminals get slapped on the wrist. They get a little, you know, small jail sentence or whatever, or, or, you know, and, then, and then they're set free. And then the person who, who was wrong, it's like they start to think, well, what did I do wrong? Because if that's all they deserve when they, when they destroy somebody's life, when they ruin somebody's life, when they, when they take, go to such extreme to defile somebody and that, that's all they get, of course they're going to be screwed up now because that person deserves to die. It's not some light thing. It's not some small matter. But let's keep reading. I don't want to get off into the other areas because, that, that, again, that could take an entire sermon of itself. So verse number 20, the Bible says here, but if he thrust him of hatred or hurl at him by lying of weight that he die or in enmity smite him with his hand that he die, he that smote him shall surely be put to death for he is a murderer. The revenger of blood shall slay the murderer when he meeteth him. So this is talking about someone who hated the other person and basically had it out for him to kill him. And, and in this case, he's saying, like, even if he uses his hands, like, if you went after someone and you just wanted to kill that person and they went out and kill him, then you're a murderer. Verse number 22, but if he thrust him suddenly without enmity, which means they weren't enemies, he didn't hate him. If he thrust him suddenly without enmity or have cast upon him anything without laying of weight. Laying of weight means you know, you're, you're premeditating, you're planning, you're, you're setting a trap, right? You're, 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 you're setting things up, and then when he comes right here, this is going to be the best time, he's going to be defenseless, I'm going to attack here. That's laying of weight. And he says that, um, Let's get, I'll start reading in verse 22 again. But if he thrust him suddenly without enmity or have cast upon him anything without laying of weight or with any stone wherewith a man may die, seeing him not and cast it upon him that he die and was not his enemy, neither sought his harm, then the congregation shall judge between the slayer and the revenger of blood according to these judgments. And the congregation shall deliver the slayer out of the hand of the revenger of blood and the congregation shall restore him to the city of his refuge whither he was fled and he shall abide in it unto the death of the high priest, which was anointed with the holy oil. But if the slayer shall at any time come without the border of the city of his refuge, whither he was fled, and the revenger of blood find him without the borders of the city of his refuge, and the revenger of blood kill the slayer, he shall not be guilty of blood, because he should have remained in the city of his refuge until the death of the high priest. But after the death of the high priest, the slayer shall return into the land of his possession. And this is an interesting aspect here of, of what happens when someone commits manslaughter, when someone kills another person, but they didn't mean to do it. They weren't lying away. They didn't hate them. You know, an accident happened and they died. He's saying, okay, you're not going to die for that. 
Your life isn't going to be taken in that situation, but you have to go into this other city of refuge. You have to go live there, you know, again, because you don't want the people, the family who cared for the person that died mixed right in with this other person that was responsible for that person's death. And he's saying, you know, and if you leave, if you don't like that, if you decide, you know what, I'm going to go back and visit so-and-so, and the revenger of blood find you and kill you, then, that's, then there's nothing, no penalty to be paid for that person that ended up, he said, because you should have stayed there because that's the ruling. That's the sentence. And the only time they're allowed to return then is at the death of the high priest. So, um, again, the value of life is very high. And that's why even in a case of manslaughter where you didn't mean to do it, if you don't listen to that judgment and go back, he's saying, well, that's on you then. Uh, after, afterwards, we'll, we'll, we'll okay. let's keep going here on the verse number um, 28, verse number 29, excuse me. So these things shall be for a statute of judgment unto you throughout your generations and all your dwellings. Whoso killeth any person, the murderer shall be put to death by the mouth of witnesses, but one witness shall not testify against any person to cause him to die. Moreover, you shall take no satisfaction for the life of a murderer which is guilty of death, but he shall be surely put to death. Now, the couple of things it mentions here is that nobody is going to be put to death at the mouth of one witness. So when you're trying somebody and you're trying to find the evidence, hey, this person died and you have one witness, they're saying you're not, you cannot put another person to death based on the, the, the word of one person. You have to have two or three witnesses at least in order to say, to find guilt in a person that they have uh, committed this crime. Because it is such a serious punishment of, of losing your life. You can't just put that in, you know, one person could lie, and if he's the only person around, no one will know that that person's lying. You have to at least have two, per like if, if someone's going to lie, you at least have to have two people, and you could compare their stories and their testimonies to see if their witness agrees together. Right, that's why when all the false witnesses came against Jesus Christ, their witness didn't agree together. They, they were coming up with all these lies they were throwing at Jesus, but they couldn't get their story straight. Why? Because they were all lies. If you're recounting something that happened, and it really happened, and you're telling the truth, well, everybody's story should pretty much be the same because you saw the same event because the same thing happened, and it's, it's the truth. But when you're making something up, your details, when people start asking you, you're grilling you on what, what actually happened, when you've made something up and someone else has made something up, it's going to be a lot harder to get your stories to match, right? And that's, that's one of the reasons why he says, okay, look, there has to be at least two witnesses because you really need to be diligent about making sure that this person is guilty of the crime before you take their life away. Again, because life is so precious. So, but then the other thing, it says here not to take satisfaction. Now, what it, what it's, when it says satisfaction, it doesn't, it's not talking about being satisfied, hey, I'm glad that that person's being put to death. That's not what it, the, the term satisfaction is referring to. The term satisfaction is referring to another payment other than that person being put to death. So it's saying not to take satisfaction, meaning like, well, don't just accept a large sum of money for this person not to be put to death. That's what it's talking about, about receiving satisfaction. We'll keep reading. It says, More we shall take no satisfaction for the life of a murderer which is guilty of death. And that's why it says, But he shall be surely put to death. That is the judgment. So, you know, if someone offers, oh, oh, no, don't put me to death. I'll give you a million dollars. Just don't put me to death. God says, No. I don't care. He says, I don't even care if, that's, if, that, if the family says that's okay with them. No, you don't do it. The murderer needs to be put to death. That's the only way that the shedding of blood can be right. You cannot take satisfaction. It says in verse 32, and you shall take no satisfaction for him that has fled to the city of his refuge, that he should come again to dwell in the land until the death of the priest. So he's saying, even in the person that commits manslaughter, he's saying, you can't just say, oh, I'll pay this big fine to you. I'll make it right. But just let me come back home. He says, no, that's not the way that justice is served. You can't just pay off whoever as satisfaction. He says, the only, this is the only way that this can be handled. It's the only way justice could be served. There is no other way around this. And it's, you know, and it's also not locking someone up in a cage for the rest of their life. That's not, you can't take that satisfaction for the murderer. That's not justice. 
That's not what God said. You can't just say, oh yeah, well, instead of putting him to death, we're just going to put him in a cage, we're going to feed him, and he's just going to live out the rest of his life there. That's, that's not what God has instituted as, as justice. Verse 34, defile not therefore the land which ye shall inhabit wherein I dwell, for I the Lord dwell among the children of Israel. So he's saying defile not the land, because when blood is shed, the land is defiled. And the only way that that, that can be offset is with the shedding of blood of the person who commit the murder, if murder was committed. Now, the principle is laid out here. I've got a lot of other things to go uh, into, so I didn't, want, I didn't necessarily even want to spend as much time as we did on this, but it's important to go through what the Bible is laying out here of manslaughter versus premeditated murder. And the principles laid out here, as well as a few other places uh, regarding the death of a person in someone else's hands. And of course, the judges were appointed to use the law and to apply it appropriately for every case that came up. And I think the clear distinction here is intent, right? Is someone your enemy? Is someone, you know, did you have it out for this person or was it just an accident? That's a major part of, is a person a murderer or did they just commit manslaughter? Now we're going to get into a few other situations. And because this, is, this has come up even in, you know, in the news today or in, in, in general in, you know, in recent times of uh, laws that are in the United States, such as you know, there's a king of your castle, right? the castle law, which says that you can defend your home and your property from intruders and that use of lethal force is justified. I believe that completely is in line with Scripture. But see, people, this, this stuff comes up when you get these cases, you know, the, the Trayvon Martin and everything else, and that's the stand your ground, which is then even outside of your home, you don't have, and basically, that's a little bit different. There's a, there's, it's, it's, it's slightly more nuanced, but um, of, it's, it's basically saying that you don't have to flee, that you can stand your ground and take someone else's life. And that's a, a, maybe a, a very oversimplification of, of the law. But um, we're going to look and see what's biblical. We're going to start off with an intruder. So if you'd like to, you could turn to your numbers, turn to Exodus 22. Just go a couple books backwards, Exodus 22. We're going to deal with, with how the Bible deals with, say, the, the king of your castle, or the, you know, being able to... Um, use force against someone who's intruding into your house. Exodus 22. Exodus 22 deals with a thief. And it's important to make that distinction also. This is talking about someone who's coming in to rob you. So it doesn't say a person who's coming in to kill you. And it doesn't say a person who's coming in to, you know, rape. It just says a thief. Exodus 22, verse number one, the Bible reads, If a man shall steal an ox or a sheep and kill it or sell it, he shall restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. If a thief be found breaking up and be smitten that he die, there shall no blood be shed for him. So if you catch a thief in your house or whatever, and he says, and he be hit, like, like you hit him, you, 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 you attack him, whatever, and he dies, no blood's going to be shed for him. That use of force is allowed. It's appropriate. It says, but then it says in verse 3, if the sun be risen upon him, there shall be blood shed for him, for he should make full restitution. If he have nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. It's, it's assumed in verse number 2 that the thief comes at night. Because that is the most common time for a thief to go and do anything. It's going to be at night. I mean, the, the workers of wickedness are usually, typically, performing their crimes at night under cover of darkness. It's a lot easier for them to get in. People are sleeping. Get in. Get away. And he says, look, if it's at night and you kill the guy, no blood's going to be shed. But if it's in the daytime, and let's say you know, you're at home and you see this guy breaking into your stuff and stealing your car, stealing your, you know, stealing your animals... You can't just go out and kill him. Why? Because there's a high value on life. Now, obviously, that person, you know, and, and stealing in the Bible did not carry a death sentence. They would have to restore fourfold, fivefold, sevenfold, depending on the situation. The Bible outlines all that stuff in the law, but it's not something that, that someone loses their life over. But see, at night, 
you don't know why the person is there. It's not like you, you can necessarily see the person just stealing your stuff. The Bible says, Jesus Christ himself said in John 10, 10, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. You don't know why that when a person breaks in your house at night, you don't know if they're there to rape. You don't know if they're there to kill. You don't know if they're there to steal. Someone breaks into your place, you know, there's someone getting, you know, and you, and you end up, you know, attacking them, hitting them, and they die. Completely justified use of force. There's not going to be any blood shed for that person. Now, in all of this, you have to realize it's not that God doesn't want you killing anybody other than if judgment needs to be executed on somebody. He doesn't want you killing a person. It's not God, you know, there, there's a high enough value on life that he's saying, I don't want you doing this. Now, if someone needs, to, you know, if, if something happens and you're put in a situation and that person dies, okay, well, you're not going to be, you know, um, found guilty and, and be put to death as a result. But um, you shouldn't be on, you know, basically what I'm saying is you still shouldn't be on a hair trigger to just be ready to, to shoot and kill somebody just because, oh, they're, you know, they're stealing my stuff. I mean, if I got my car parked in my driveway and I see someone breaking into it, you know, I'm not going to go out there with my gun and, and go shoot them because they're stealing my car. The, uh, the concept of using force to defend yourself, you know, we're getting into some more self-defense issues, is found in many places in the Bible. And, this, and, and, and using these principles, we could understand that, uh, you know, especially with, with numbers, 35, that it wasn't talking about someone defending themselves. Nehemiah 4 is a great story of, uh, of people defending themselves and being ready to defend themselves and defending themselves with weapons. In Nehemiah 4, remember that's when they were, uh, in Nehemiah, they were rebuilding the temple. They were rebuilding Jerusalem. And they were, they were brought back after their captivity and they were going to rebuild and, and there was a lot of enemies that were trying to stop the work that they were trying to do. They didn't want them to rebuild Jerusalem. They didn't want them to rebuild the temple. And um, we're going to start pick up reading here in verse number 11 of Nehemiah chapter 4. The Bible reads, And our adversaries said, They shall not know, neither see, till we come in the midst among them and slay them, and cause the work to cease. So these were the enemies that are trying to stop the work. And they were conspiring. They were plotting to go in and kill the people who were working trying to build the wall of Jerusalem. They were going to go in and try to kill them so that they could cause the work to stop. They're saying, they're not going to see us. We're going to go right among them. We're just going to kill them. And then they'll finally stop working and building on this. Verse number 12 says, And it came to pass that when the Jews which dwelt by them came, they said unto us ten times, From all places whence ye shall return unto us, they will be upon you. So they, they were made aware of this. The, the enemy is going to come in and, and try to destroy them. Verse number 13, Therefore set I in the lower places behind the wall, and on the higher places I even set the people after their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, Be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible, and fight for your brethren, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your houses. When people are coming against you to kill you, he says, you stand up and you fight. You fight for your husbands. You fight for your wives. You fight for your children. You fight for your houses. You fight for what you got. You don't just let people come in. You know, the, the, some people will try to claim that Christianity is just like a pacifist religion. And it's not. It's not just peace at all costs. Now look, do we want to live peaceably with all men as much as is possible, as much as lieth in you? Yeah, of course we do. Of course, there's a principle we try to live by. But if someone's going to come in and attack you and try to murder your family and try to murder you, guess what? You're going to get a fight. Right. Guess what? We're going to stand up and defend our life against you. And it came to pass, verse 15, when our enemies heard that it was known unto us and God had brought their counsel to naught, that we returned all of us to the wall, everyone unto his work. And it came to pass from that time forth that the half of my servants wrought in the work and the other half of them held both the spears, the shields, and the bows, and the habergens, and the rulers were behind all the house of Judah. They which builded on the wall and they that bear burdens 
with those that laid it, every one with one of his hands wrought in the work and with the other hand held a weapon. So we're going to continue this work. And if there's going to be threat of violence against us, we're, we have our weapons with us. And it wasn't just a show. It wasn't just to scare the bad guys away. It was there to use it if needed. Now, they weren't going off then, oh, you're going to kill us? Well, we'll go kill you first. It wasn't this preemptive killing saying, oh, we found out that you're going to kill us. So I'm just going to go and kill you and do this preemptive strike. Because that's wicked. They relied on God, and we look, we need to rely on God. But you also ought to have, be able to defend yourself as well. You know, of course we rely on the Lord for our protection. He's our defense. Oh, all, I mean, read the book of Psalms. The Lord's my rock. He's my shield. He's my buckler. He's my defense. We rely on God to protect us. But it's very biblical for you to also make sure that you are armed so that people can't just run all over you and people are trying to kill you and murder you, that you're able to defend yourself. And look, these are people being attacked for doing the work of God. Yet they still had one hand to the work and one hand on a weapon, ready to be able to defend themselves. Esther is another great example that is, that is biblical of, of God's people defending themselves from murderers. Remember the story of Esther. There's a, um, Haman hated the Jews. He hated Mordecai because Mordecai wouldn't bow down to him. So he made this decree that on a certain day, they're going to go and basically kill all the Jews. That was his plan. He, he sent out these letters and said, okay, on this day, we're going to round them all up and we're going to kill them. And, of course, Esther went to the king and, you know, and Haman ended up being put to death. But then they couldn't change that law because of stupid law, the Medes and Persians. You couldn't overturn anything. So he said, OK, well, here's what we're going to do then. Go ahead, Mordecai. You, you decide what's right. And Mordecai sent out letters basically saying that, you know what, the Jews can defend themselves and they could kill anyone that's coming after them to kill them. Anyone that's intending harm unto them. That they don't just have to sit there and take it, but they're able to defend their lives. I'll just read for you. I have to turn to Esther 8.11. says, Wherein the king granted the Jews, which were in every city, to gather themselves together and to stand for their life, to destroy, to slay, and to cause to perish all the power of the people and province that would assault them, both little ones and women, and to take the spoil of them for a prey. So anyone that wants to come after them and kill them, so they're allowed to, to defend themselves and, and no punishment is going to come as a result of that because they're defending their life. Two very clear examples in Scripture of, of righteous de self-defense. Defending your life, defending your property, defending the work that you're doing against someone who's out to kill, someone who's out to destroy. People will say, oh, but everything that you turn to is all in the Old Testament. Aren't things different in the New Testament? The, and, and look, there are verses we have to reconcile in the New Testament, but no, the New Testament is not teaching anything different when it comes to self-defense. Um, turn, if you would, to Luke 22. Luke 22. So there's verses, you know, Matthew 10, 16 says, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Jesus Christ sending out his disciples, saying, you know, I got work for you to do. And be, you know, basically saying, be aware because there's a bunch of wolves out there. And the wolves are be ready to destroy. But he says, I want you to be wise as serpents. So be aware of this. Be understanding. Be wise to what's going on and be harmless as doves. We're not going out attacking the wolves. That's what he's saying. Be harmless. Look, we're going out peacefully to do our work, to do what God told us to do. We're not, we don't have this mentality of bringing forth a physical battle to people. But if the battle comes to you, if someone's out with, with evil intent against you, completely justified to defend yourself. Uh, Matthew 5.38, you know, this is another, another verse that, that people will turn to and say, see, look, we need to be pacifists and not do anything. Um, Jesus said here, you have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that you resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. Right? As a principle of Jesus Christ, telling us, look, when people do you wrong, 
just take it. And that's where he continues to go on and say, if someone steals your cloak, hey, give, them, give them your coat also. You know, when someone takes from you, he's like, go, you know what? Allow yourself to have, to, to, to be used. Allow yourself to kind of be run over, right? But this is not saying if someone comes at you trying to take your life and kill you. I mean, if someone's angry with you and they want to punch you in the face, he's saying, don't get in a fight with them. Don't, you know, if someone clocks you, you know, there's a big difference between someone who's out to murder you and someone who's angry and strikes you. Huge difference. And we're in a position, especially going out and preaching the word of God, where it may make some people angry. They may want to hit you in the face. He's saying, don't get in some fight with them. Even if, even if someone hits you in the face, they don't, don't, don't go and get in some fight with them. But if someone's coming out for your life or you're for, you, know, you have to protect your family and kids, we're going to get to that in Luke 22 in just a second. And if, you know, finally, there's another verse, and I already uh, referenced this earlier in Romans 12. The Bible says, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. See, this is the principle, and this is not just New Testament. This is Old and New Testament, that God wants us to live peaceably with all men. That's his desire. That's what he wants us to be able to do. And we're not supposed to be taking vengeance into our own hands. We don't, we don't just say, well, this was wrong and we need to make it right. God will repay. Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. We aren't supposed to just make, right every wrong. We go through this life peaceably. However, there still is a time and a place to be able to defend yourself. Luke 22 more words from Jesus Christ. And this is important. This is the same Jesus that said to turn the other cheek. This is the same Jesus that said to be harmless as doves. In Luke 22, verse number 35, the Bible says, And he said unto them, When I sent you without purse and scrip and shoes, lacked ye anything? And they said, Nothing. When Jesus Christ was with his disciples, he sent them out two and two to preach the gospel. And he said, you know, he told them, he said, don't bring an extra coat. Don't bring extra shoes. You know, just go off. He says, what, you know, don't bring any food. Don't bring any money. Just go and do my work. Teaching them, look, rely on me. I'm, as long as I'm here with you, basically, he said, you don't have anything to worry about. I'm going to take care of you. Everything's going to be just fine. You don't even need any money. People will take care of you. I promise you, just do my work. You'll be fed. You'll be clothed. You'll be taken care of. Nothing to worry about. And that's what happened. And, and in Matthew 10, 16, when he said to be harmless as doves, guess what? That's when Jesus was with them and sending them out that way also. I'm not saying don't apply that today, but I'm just saying when we're looking at the words of Jesus, Luke 22, what he's saying here is after what he told them when he sent them out in the midst of wolves. Now, verse 36, he says, then said he, because he said, look, did you lack anything? They're like, no, everything was great. It worked out just the way you said. We didn't need anything. Luke 22, it's before he's about to be crucified. He says, Then said he unto them, But now, he that hath a purse, let him take it, and likewise his scrip, and he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. He's saying, Now I'm telling you something a little different. Now when you go out, take your money with you. Now when you go out, look, if you don't have a sword... Sell your garment and get one. Now, a garment, you know, we've talked about this in the past, is something of high value because they didn't have the sweatshops in China just churning out all different kinds of clothing. You know, a garment took, you know, was handcrafted. It took a lot more money and it typically would last you a long time and it was valuable to receive garments. So people didn't have these huge walk-in closets of all these different garments. They, they would have, you know, maybe a couple different things that they could wear at all, like one or two, you know, just a change of garment was a big deal. It costs a lot of money. And he's saying, look, if you don't have a sword, you need to go and, and sell your garment and get one. He wasn't telling them that they need a sword to go out and hunt either, by the way. He wasn't saying that so you could provide food for yourself. The sword was meant to defend yourself. And as we go, just like people today want to say, oh, yeah, you could have a gun so you could go hunting. No, I don't have a gun so I could go hunting. I'd like to hunt, and I use a gun to hunt. But I wear a gun to protect myself, to defend myself. Jesus was telling them to have a sword, to be able to defend themselves. 
All of the other principles are still there. Be peaceable, live peaceably. Look, be as doves, but you're still able to defend yourself. And that is New Testament coming from the mouth of Jesus Christ himself. Amen. So no, there's nothing wrong. People flipped out. I don't remember how many years ago it was when, um, remember Chris Broughton at Faithful Word you know, brought his, open carried his AR to, to some event with Obama and, you know, and all the, all the, there was this big focus on the members of Faith Word Baptist Church that had, that were carrying firearms, carrying guns. Oh, you shouldn't have a gun in church. There we go. It's like, Jesus told his disciples to carry a sword. What do you mean? You shouldn't be wearing a gun. Of course you should. Look, I wear a gun every day. Oh, actually, I'm wearing one right now. But you're in church. Yeah, this is my sword. And you know what? For every day that I carry my firearm, guess how many people I've killed? Wow, amazing, isn't it? Why? Because I'm living peaceably. We're not going out trying to start a fight. We're not going out you know, as a tough guy trying to to intimidate people or anything like that. But you know what? I'm going to defend myself. I'm going to defend my family. I've got a wife and children that I love a lot, and I'm not going to let someone else come in and, and take their life. Why? Because their life is valuable. And I'm going to defend their life. I'm going to defend my life. I think my life is valuable. We're doing a work for the Lord. We're, as it were, building the walls of Jerusalem. So I'm going to keep a sword while I'm doing the work. And that's completely scriptural and biblical. And notice he said, uh, and they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, it is enough. We don't need to have a whole arsenal. We don't need to have, you know, look. I don't think there's anything wrong with having, you know, multiple guns. I've got multiple guns. Okay, it's kind of fun to, to, to go out and shoot. However, um, you, you know, you don't need to be armed to the teeth, right, when you're walking around. I don't need to have my knife here, my gun here, my gun here, and my, you know, bulletproof vest, and, you know, like, okay. all right, that's, that's enough. <laughs> it's like, we got a couple swords, good, you're protected, fine. That's the whole point, you know, you're... That's, that's, that's what he's teaching them there. You're not going out now with an army and a tank like, all right, we're going soul winning. Let's get the SWAT team assembled to, to go out and, and knock on doors. No. <laughs> that's not the point. We don't need to, to take it to that level. Now, um, just in closing, there's a couple other interesting, because I was talking about, you know, the biblical use of force. We've got a little bit of time. Um, these are all instances of lethal force, right? When's it right? And, and ultimately, because God values life, he doesn't want us just taking people's life for every cause, right? Or for, or for even small, even for things like stealing, where someone's wronging you, they're legitimately wronging you. But there are times when it's acceptable, when you, when you can take someone else's life and there's not a judgment that's going to come against you. For example, someone breaks into your house at night. You, know, you shouldn't be out to just awesome, someone's breaking in, now I'm going to kill them. You know, I've seen videos on YouTube of people like, lit, like setting traps to lure people in so that they could like kill them. That's crazy. That's murder. That's murder. You're laying, you're, I mean, you're, you're laying in wait to kill somebody. So yeah, but they were stealing from me. Yes, so what? You know what? The punishment for a thief is not death. I would say this, any, if God has a death penalty on, some, on something and someone tries to commit that against you, you're justified in killing that person from stopping them to do that to you. Rape, kidnapping, if someone tries to steal my children and I use lethal force against them to stop them from stealing my children, guess what? That's a, that's a, that's a valid use of force. Um, just look up the, the different instances used you know, where, where God's putting a death penalty on, on crimes. Sodomy. Someone comes in to try to sodomize. Someone in my family, they're, you know, 
guess what? They're going to met with a bullet. And that's completely justified. But I'm not out to go and kill people either. And if someone gets in a fight, a fist fight with me, I'm not going to try to kill them. I'm not. If someone is lying in wait and maybe surprise attacks and, and I'm with my family and they're going to try to, you know, if I, I think they're going to try to, I mean, their, their intent is to try to kill, then that's a different story. But if someone just gets angry with me because I'm knocking on doors, I'm preaching Jesus, you know, the, it's, you need to be able to determine what their intent is because that's the difference between someone who's going to be a murderer and someone who just might accidentally kill somebody. Um, use of force, not lethal force. There's um, other times where it's justified to use force against people, I believe, or you can put your hands on somebody. And, and escort them out, as it were. Um, Jesus Christ himself used force, getting people out of the temple. I'll read for you from John chapter 2. John chapter 2, verse 13. The Bible says, And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, which is to say a whip, if you don't know what a scourge is, a scourge is a whip. He made a whip of small cords. He drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables and said unto them that sold doves, take these things, hence make not my father's house and house of merchandise and his disciples remember that it was written the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Jesus didn't just use his words to cast people out of the temple. Now, he did use his words, but he also flipped over some tables. He also made a whip, and was he drove them out. You know, he drive cattle, yeah, yeah, get out of here, and, 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 and was striking a whip at them to light a fire under their rear to get out. That was a use of force. He was physically driving them out of the temple. And you think about the temple, was, it was his house. Anyways, he was driving people out of his house. So if we need to drive someone out of here, or if I need to drive someone out of my house, no, we're not going to kill them, but you know what? It's valid to use force against somebody. To, you know what? You're getting out of here. We're going to escort you out, and you will be physically removed if, you're, you know, if you start causing, you know, making God's house a house of merchandise or doing something, that, you know, doing something that's not appropriate here. You're going to be... You know, if people try to come in and, and cause a disruption and just here bent on, on disrupting our service, then guess what? We're going to escort them out. And it's completely justified in God's eyes. Um, Nehemiah also threatened the use of force. I love Nehemiah. Nehemiah is a great character. He's a real strong leader. And um, one of the things that was going on there is he instituted, you know, he said, look, we're not going to, you know, the sat he was reinstituting the Sabbath, basically. He's saying there's not going to be anyone buying or selling or we're not going to be doing any work on the Sabbath days. And the merchants kept coming in on the Sabbath, causing the people of Israel to sin. He's saying, look, this isn't going to happen anymore. He locked the gates so they couldn't come into the city. And then he still showed up outside. And this is, this is what he said. I'll read for you what he said. He says, and it came to pass that when the gates of Jerusalem began to be dark before the Sabbath, I commanded the gates should be shut and charged that they should not be open till after the Sabbath. And some of my servants said I at the gates, that there should no burden be brought in on the Sabbath day. So the merchants and sellers of all kind of ware lodged without Jerusalem once or twice. They're saying, first couple weeks, they just stayed out there. They're like, okay, well, you lock the gates. We're just going to hang out here. We're going to wait. You know, people may come out to us or whatever. And it says in verse 21, Then I testified against them and said unto them, Why lodge ye about the wall? If you do so again, I will lay hands on you. And he wasn't talking about praying for him. He wasn't talking about giving him the Holy Ghost. He's talking about laying hands. So I'm going to lay hands on you. He says, from that time forth, they came no more on the Sabbath. He's saying, you keep, this, you keep coming back here, guess what? I'm going to be tossing you out. There are, biblical, there are uh, you know, examples in the Bible of a use of force. Now, we don't just take this and run with it and just... Oh, man, so Nehemiah did this, so I'm going to go off and, and get in fights and start, you know, start throwing my weight around every chance I get. No, you've completely missed the point. You've missed the principle. The, the overarching principle is that 
We're not to be taking people's life. The overarching principle is that life is valuable. The overarching principle is that we're to live peaceably with all men. Amen. However, we're also not just going to allow everything to, to happen and not stand up and defend ourselves from aggressors, from wicked people who are out to do evil. Amen. Spiral rides, I have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for, um, for all the great teachings of your word. Lord, I pray that you please help us to be uh, strong spiritually and um, strong physically, dear Lord, especially us men, to be able to defend our, our families, to be able to protect the, the valuable, precious life that you've given us, dear Lord, and to, uh, to also be able to do the work that you've committed unto us to do and that we wouldn't, um, that we're not going to be aggressive or, or out for a physical fight with people, dear Lord, but also that we're not going to allow um, ultimately just the, the, you know, our, our death or something to, to happen because we're not willing to defend ourselves. God, we thank you for um, providing us with this life and this great work to do, and I pray that you would please just help us to continue to, to do more for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.